time uh, between this crowd and lunch, and I took a walk outside just before lunch looks good. That's a lot better than being be after lunch, I think. And it's certainly better than being between this crowd and an adult beverage of some choice, some uh, sort. Um, but we'll try to keep it, keep it um, exciting here as we go through. So, um, where's Pat? Um, thanks for putting this together. We were talking in the hall. This venue is um, different than other conferences that we collect at. I think it's um, more collaborative. It's um, more small and intimate. And uh, so thanks for setting it up, this environment for us. I always look forward to coming here. Boeing's been celebrating um, over the last year its 100th year as a company. And you know, that kind of parallels the the um, history of aviation in space. And so it's been a real opportunity to kind of reflect on how far the industry and us as a company have come over the last hundred years and then try to project that into the future and imagine um, you know, what's possible in the next hundred years. So I, I've, I've pulled together some um, sets of pictures here that show historical things and then kind of project them into the future talk a little bit about what things are possible as we go forward, you know, what grand adventures kind of await us, and then what does the role of commercialization uh, play in all that? Uh, so that's what we'll go through here. Let me see. I got a slide here. That worked. Okay. This is a picture of um, Calbraith Perry Rogers. He was the first gentleman to fly across the United States. He did it in a, um, a Wright Flyer. It was an it was, uh, early version of that thing. And he was after the Hertz Prize. It was a $50,000 prize. Um, he needed to fly coast to coast in 30 days to get that prize. He took off from uh, Sheepshead Bay, New York, on September 17th of 1911. And he made it to um, Pasadena, California on November 5th that year. So it took 49 days. He didn't quite get the prize. Um, it was a Model EX Wright Flyer. It averaged 50 to 60 miles an hour on its 35 horsepower engine. Uh, it, he had three train, load, three train cars loaded with spare parts that went with him, ahead of him. Um, he stopped 70 times, had 15 crash landings and went to the hospital several times. Uh, broke a leg in Arizona, had shrapnel in his arm from a blown cylinder, and a lot of cuts, scrapes, bruises, etc. There were three parts of the plane that were original when he landed finally in Pasadena. <laughs> a wing strut, one of the ailerons, and the oil pan from the engine. So, you know, do you think people in that time could imagine what the airline industry would look like 100 years into the future. You know, today we have um, 87,000 flights that crisscross the United States every day. It takes five and a half hours to fly from New York to LA instead of 49 days. Um, most of those planes don't have crash landings, and nearly all of them get there with all their parts. So I think it's just a, a neat story to think about and reflect upon how things have changed in the last hundred years, how people at that time could never have imagined <clears throat> what would happen during the next hundred years, and not limit ourselves by what we can imagine today relative to what will happen in the next hundred years. So here's, here's just the kind of history of, of some commercial airplanes. I, I selected um, some Boeing airplanes. The f first one is Bill Boeing's first plane, the Boeing Model 1. It was um, flown in 1916. Um, the first jetliner, the Boeing 707, is shown there. The, the company was bet on that plane. It, it was um, a commitment to invest $16 million, which at that time was a heck of a lot of money. That doesn't sound like a lot now, but it was huge. It was equivalent to all the profit the company had made since the end of uh, World War II up until that time. So it was a huge amount. And then that, that led to the 707, which um, in just two years, that plane ecl eclipsed the travel by rail and sea that was ongoing at the time. And it was really the beginning of the jet age. 
And then, you, you know, you can fast forward to the, um, well, I'll go through Space Shuttle. That was an amazing um, airplane of sorts. Uh, flew in 1981 for the first time, 135 missions, as um, most people in the audience know. We assembled ISS, just an incredible vehicle. And then the 787, um, who would have imagined 100 years ago that we would have a factory where fiber and glue went in one end of the factory and chunks of airplane come out the other end of the factory? And we end up with this really efficient, um, reliable vehicle. So if you kind of combine the shuttle and some of the, the jet planes, you can imagine a future where you have a plane, a space plane, that, that might be a point-to-point -point kind of plane that skips into the space on its way, or <clears throat> perhaps just goes at high Mach numbers through the atmosphere. But certainly there will be commercial airplanes in the future that, that connect the world um, not quite as dramatic as 49 days to five hours, but, but nearly. And so I think uh, there's a lot to think about there. How about transportation to low Earth orbit? Um, you know, so we started with the first uh, John Glenn's flight in the early 60s, and that was 50 years ago. And we've progressed through Gemini Apollo, and I showed a picture of Starliner. There are, of course, other vehicles being developed for um, commercial travel to LEO as well. But I think the important thing here is that we're at a transition to at least a somewhat commercial kind of environment for low Earth orbit transportation. I think we'll look back at this point in time as, as when that happened. And we've been doing this mission for a long time, like I said, you know, over 50 years. So the mission's understood. We're in certain new technologies, new business models, <clears throat> and that's allowing us to come up with um, what's the beginnings of a, um, a commercial activity. For this to catch on, we have to have lower launch costs. Um, we have to add more reusability to get those costs down. And we have to have a deeper market um, such that, that this can become a true commercial market um, on top of what it is already now. Launch systems, of course, have evolved a lot over this time. You know, I'm showing the the Thor missile there, which was um, the first operational ballistic missile deployed by the Air Force. It was uh, only 65 feet tall, 8 feet in diameter, pretty small by standards of today's rockets. You know, but it got us going. It led to the Delta II, which is shown on there. It's kind of a workhorse launch vehicle. Um, the Saturn V was a, a, huge, um, a huge increase in the capability of rocketry. I had some facts that, that the folks pulled out. It had 6.2 million pounds of flux. The rate of the, or the weight of the fuel was equal to 400 elephants in <laughs> the Saturn V. Huge vehicle. So anyway, that got us to the moon. Um, certainly advanced the technology of rocketry a bunch in a short period of time. Uh, Delta IV Heavy, shown on there, launched in 2004. That was designed for a lot of reusability. It was imagined that we would be putting constellations of satellites in orbit. It was funded primarily um, by McDonnell Douglas at the time, now Boeing. So it was a, a real commercial investment at that point in time. And the space shuttle, um, of course, as I mentioned, was a, a workhorse of building the space station. I think we forget that the space shuttle was reusable. You know, the vehicle itself flew a lot of times. The SRBs, the solid rocket boosters, were recovered and, and refurbished and flew. The only piece that we really threw away was the external tank. So we learned a lot about reusability. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily the, the um, end all of getting costs down if it's not done properly. The shuttle end up, it was envisioned to fly 50 times a year, uh, once a week. There are presentations that are in the archives of, of how that would happen. Uh, ended up flying five or six times a year. And so um, reusability is something that we really need to focus on to make economical. It, it doesn't happen just because something is, is reusable. And then that's all led to um, a large vehicle called the SLS, um, which is just an incredible machine. Um, it's going to launch in 2018. The first flight tanks are built at Michu. It will come together and, and move to Stennis in 2017 for its test firing and then down to the KSC um, for launch. And it'll be the workhorse that takes large pieces of the complexes that we're going to send back to the moon and on to Mars into orbit so that um, we can do that. And then, of course, there are several commercial entries into the market. Um, 
the SpaceX Falcon 9, Blue Origin uh, family of rockets that are coming online that will have a real impact, I think, on where we're going in the future. And DARPA just awarded a contract for a vehicle called XS-1, which is a, a, a flyback booster that's, the program's designed to launch it 10 times in 10 days. That's a real challenge and we'll be working towards that goal going forward. So lots of, of um, things in the future on launch systems. As we all discussed, the key is to get the cost of launch down so that we can enable uh, more use, more commercialization of space. LEO destinations. Um, this is a, kind of a history of LEO destinations. So the first one was Skylab. Went up in the 70s. Three different crews went up to Skylab and spent time there. A lot of research was done and um, really kind of paved the way for low Earth orbit destinations. Space Station, of course, uh, uh, you know, an endeavor that the whole world has chipped into and, and made possible, just an incredible machine. And it was completed in 2011. It took um, about 45 shuttle launches to complete the assembly of that. If we'd had a larger launch vehicle, I think the space station would look much different and would have been done in four or five flights possibly. But we did it with what we had and it's, it's just an incredible machine. And then if we look forward, you know, there are people working on on future destinations. Um, Bigelow Aerospace has some really um, good concepts for inflatable modules that could be in low Earth orbit and also be part of, of um, ventures to cislunar and on to Mars. And you can imagine um, future Skylabs that could be made out of um, tanks of the SLS similar to the way Skylab was built. The key to all this, and I really appreciated the comments that Bill Gerstmeyer shared with us this morning, because the key to all this is working on the demand side of low Earth orbit commercial utilization. We are really good at the supply side. I mean, we all get excited about building launch vehicles, about building space transportation vehicles, about building destinations. The key to really having a commercial market is to find a demand side that's willing to pay for all that. And then, then it'll really take off as a commercial. So I think we as a group have to, have to focus on that and have to be a part of stimulating that kind of thinking and encouraging folks to imagine what can be done in low Earth orbit for profit so that there is a commercial industry that, that can be the customer for all this capability that we're developing. Looking forward, you know, we're going to Mars and that's an exciting journey. Um, I think we'll do that in phases. Going to Mars is a, is a long ways away. It's a difficult challenge. So we're developing concepts now that say we start learning things on space station. That's kind of phase zero, the phase we're in now. We'll move to the area around the moon again and we'll prove out technologies, build vehicles that um, eventually will go further away from the moon and then finally on to Mars. The first pieces of that are in production, the SLS Orion. The next pieces are a habitat and a solar electric propulsion capability that will be needed, and those are in kind of um, development, uh, early development phases. NASA is running a series of broad area announcements where there are six companies participating in what a habitat could look like, and they'll take the best ideas of that and, and fuse those into a, a detailed concept for what a cislunar outpost would look like, and then we'll be on to that adventure. And then we'll work on landers and, and um, descent landing kind of capabilities that will be needed uh, for the area of Mars. This is a long journey. And we got to get started though, and we're doing that, and we're on the way. So it's, a, it's an exciting adventure. I think we got a video now just to kind of describe Boeing's view of what that trip to Mars might look like. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I became one. I remember as a youngster, I watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. My father and I developed a love of flying in space together. We would go to museums, we would go to air shows. I was lucky enough to become a Navy pilot and then fly and command the space shuttle. For 16 years, we have been living in the relative comfort of low Earth orbit. What we need now is the challenge of living a little bit further away from home, living days away. 
What will it take to keep humans safe as we go into the unknown of the rest of the solar system? Taking humans all the way to Mars and bringing them safely back to Earth will be very challenging. Mars is at least 100 times further away than the moon. The opportunity to travel from Earth to Mars comes around about every two years. The Earth has to be catching up with Mars in its orbit to give you that shortest distance, and that's the ideal launch window. The first phase of going to Mars will occur at the International Space Station, where we'll learn about long-duration human spaceflight. We're perfecting the things that will help astronauts get to Mars safely. And first and foremost is the things that keep astronauts alive, like clean air and clean water. The next phase will be to establish an outpost near the moon where we can test the capabilities and limitations of the hardware so that we can get humans all the way to Mars and safely all the way back. Having a cislunar outpost enables international partnerships and commercial opportunities, such as exploration of the lunar surface and scientific and technological research. After cislunar space, we'll start the actual missions to Mars. The first mission will be to Mars orbit. This mission will teach us about the space systems that will take us to Mars and back. The next mission will send humans to the surface of Mars. The crews will undertake detailed scientific research and investigation. They will start to unlock the secrets of Mars. The race to the moon captured the world's attention. Building the International Space Station united 15 nations. The journey to Mars will inspire all of humankind as we push deeper into space than we ever have before. Who are our next space explorers? Chances are they're around us today. I'm sure there's a young man or woman somewhere in a classroom today dreaming of going to Mars. Okay, that's gonna be an adventure. Can we get the next slide up? There it is, okay. I got it on the monitor too, how about that? Uh, so this, the, the, we talked about in the video, you know, the, the next phase of this is going to cislunar. So this is a, a concept uh, for cislunar. Um, we'll see how the whole thing sorts out, but this is an idea of how we could build a complex in the area around the moon. It could have participation from international, certainly building parts of those modules. And I think it can have participation from um, what we refer to as commercial entities. Um, participating is certainly from a logistics resupply perspective, um, from a perspective of providing uh, some of the modules uh, possibly, and from the perspective of there are companies that talk about going to the surface of the moon um, in, a, in a more um, uh, commercial um, kind of way. And certainly that journey is easier from the area of the moon to the surface of the moon than it is all the way from Cape Canaveral to the surface of the moon. So this could serve as an outpost for um, ideas people have of perhaps retrieving asteroids for mining or going to the surface of the moon and doing exploration, uh, whatever that might be. But I think it's important as we develop these kind of concepts that we keep collaborative and teamed with those kinds of ideas. Th these are some pictures. So um, Werner von Braun wrote a book in the 1950s. It's called Project Mars. And I think everybody in this room ought to order a copy of it and read it. It's been reprinted. Um, thankfully, you don't have to order a copy left over from the 50s. Uh, but he describes, it's a, it's a tale of um, a journey to Mars, but the preface is incredibly interesting. It's about three pages, and what he describes is, you know, during that time there were a lot of visions of space travel and what it could be, and then there were engineers working on real things that had to be done so that we could develop the rocket technology that was necessary to do that. And, and how you have to kind of wade through. Um, both of those have their place. You know, it's real important that we have visions that inspire us, that keep us going, and then we got to go to work on the practical things that, that we can actually implement and do. The pictures on the left are, are out of Von Braun's book, and the pictures on the right are some recent inspirational ideas that have been thrown out. And it's, it's interesting how they compare. I think it is real important that we embrace this inspiration and leverage that and use it as the catalyst to get us on the journey to Mars. And I encourage, I really do encourage everybody in the room to get a copy of, of that book and, and, and read and get a sense of, of where we were in the 50s 
and um, where that brilliant rocket scientist, what his vision was for the future. It's really good. So what are some other things we can do in the future? Hey, here's a picture of a vehicle on Europa. Europa is um, the moon around Mars. It's covered with an icy crust. It's got an ocean underneath it. Everywhere on Earth where there's water, there's life. Is there water in the oceans of Europa? Chances are, you know, we'll, um, but going there, I think, in the next hundred years is something we will do. And I think we'll find life there, personal view. And what will that do to us? You know, what will we think about ourselves if we discover life there on Europa? There's a lot of discussion, particularly in ESA, about a concept for a lunar village, certainly doable in the next hundred years, having um, a more permanent presence on the moon. The word village connotates that there will be um, lots of different countries involved in this. And so that's certainly something that can happen. Putting a radio telescope on the far side of the moon where it's shielded from radio wave interference from Earth so that we can listen into deep space and per, perhaps hear um, radio signals from intelligent life um, would be a, a thing that could be done. That's certainly possible in the next hundred years. And then, and then finally, um, there are concepts for building a star shade that you can look through the center of with a telescope and the shade blocks out um, distant suns so that you can see the exoplanets around those suns. And we can, um, with that kind of a system, take a picture of a planet that looks like Earth. That'll be a big deal too, I think, when we can see planets that um, just look um, totally habitable and we can imagine that there would be life there. So I think all those things are, are doable in the next hundred years. We've made an incredible amount of progress over the past hundred years um, in aviation and in space. We've achieved accomplishments that were unimaginable by the people that were thinking about this stuff a hundred years ago. I think we sit on the precipice of, of um, really starting commercialization of space, particularly low Earth orbit, um, and setting out on grand missions of discovery, you know, through our solar system and then virtually through the universe. Um, just take the first five years of that and think about what it's going to be like five years from now. We'll be flying commercial crew. SLS will have launched. Um, we'll have made um, further progress with the um, additional launch vehicles that are being um, developed by SpaceX and Blue Origin. And the James Webb Telescope will be deployed. We'll be getting pictures from that. It's, you know, that's a big change we're going to see just in the next five years. So the next hundred, what an adventure, you know, and I, I can't wait. I wish I could be around for all hundred of those years. I'm not sure I will be, um, but it's going to be exciting. And I think we are all just incredibly unfortunate, incredibly fortunate to um, be able to work and be a part of it. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. That's right. So, John, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for that presentation. For, and congratulations on a 100-year anniversary of Boeing. That's, that's very exciting. And I know you've been involved, uh, or Boeing has been involved in space for over 60 years, so it's also exciting to see what your, what your visions are for, for the future. Uh, we've got some, some interesting questions from the audience here. Um, you've been around for the Commercial Crew Program and that model. How do you see it applying to, to CISLUNAR? Yeah, so how does that commercial model apply to cislunar? I think there are some ways it can. I think there are some challenges. The, um, the model for LEO, um, there's a somewhat, you can imagine a commercial model in LEO. Um, you can also imagine a commercial model in cislunar, but I think it's a bit more of a stretch. And so putting together the business case is more challenging. I think that... Um, you know, NASA is going to develop a habitation, wants to develop, I believe, a habitation capability in the cislunar space that is then extensible to the journey to Mars. So it will be necessary, I believe, for NASA to be kind of intimately involved in shaping the requirements as those vehicles and capabilities are built. And that's a little different than the commercial model where NASA kind of set the top level requirements and then let companies go off and design a capability to meet those requirements. I'm envisioning that in that cislunar habitat, there'll be a need for them to be much more involved in why, those requirements. Why do you think that? So that it can be extensible to the journey to Mars. Okay, but, uh, so it can be extensible, but do you think that there is 
there are other areas where there's a viable commercial market in the cislunar area. Uh, Leo is ob it's much more obvious for us now, right? Yeah. We get that. Yeah, so let me go to the, the other side of, of, of why it is a, that model could work. There's a, a thought, and it, it's, I think it's doable, that you can develop a capability that would be applicable to cislunar and then bring that capability back to low Earth orbit as a commercial low Earth orbit destination. Um, and that could be a possibility. Certainly, you know, I showed a complex for um, cislunar and pieces of that complex um, could be commercial. Mm -hmm. Logistics resupply is a real opportunity. I think commercial exploration of the lunar surface from that outpost is a real possibility. I think what we have to do is, in, in all aspects of this, is not look at it as an either or. You know, there's a real fusion of this stuff and a collaboration that has to happen. And I think as a community, we do ourselves a disservice when we start the either or mm -hmm. um, dialogue. So I think there is, is a need and certainly room for both aspects of all that. Great. Uh, I'm going to go to some of the, uh, directly to the, the uh, audience questions here. How will Boeing fund the missions to Mars and your cislunar outpost? Uh, and how do these fit with your existing business units? Yeah, so, so um, you know, the um, vision we have of that is that these will be government-led explorations um, to cislunar and then on to Mars. And so the funding for that will come from the governments of the world. Um, you know, when we talk about how we might implement that in a traditional model or a, or a more commercial model, that's really discuss, a discussion about what procurement approaches will be used, in, in my view. There's, um, it's going to take incredible, um, I don't know if I'd go that far, it's going to take significant amounts of money to do that exploration. And, and it's really only within the, um, the um, resources of governments, and frankly the governments around the world, working together um, to make that kind of a journey happen, in my view. Do you think that that's, just curious, do you think that that's the optimal way, is, uh, is getting multiple uh, international governments involved? We saw it. There are benefits, right? You get more partners involved, you get to spread the costs. But as we, you know, George Neal noted, when you have more countries involved, it slows down the process as well. Where's yeah. your balance on that? So there are puts and takes. Having worked through International Space Station and being in the middle of that program, of um, I, would, I would tend towards the side of international involvement is mandatory. I think there, well, certainly there were times when the space station would have been canceled as a program but because there were international agreements in place, State Department agreements in place, um, we were compelled to continue the development of station. And that got us through a couple of times um, during its development that we might not have gotten through otherwise. For instance, after the Columbia accident, right. there was a lot of discussion about should we complete station? Well, the European module hadn't flown, the Japanese module hadn't flown, so it was kind of a moot point to even ask the question. You know, we needed to complete that. I think it's also a real tool for pulling together um, people around the world. One of my favorite stories I like to tell is early in the, in the days when we first started working with the Russians, one of the first missions was a mere docking module that came to the space station processing facility in Florida to be um, checked out and then put in the space shuttle for launch. And so this was the first group of Russian engineers that came over. And, you know, it was a curiosity to us folks who hadn't worked with the Russians. And we had a, um, a dinner of our management association, and the employees association, mm -hmm. the teammate association. And the Russian um, folks came and were a part of that dinner with us and, and spoke. And so I was sitting at a table with um, three Russian gentlemen and we had an interpreter and we were conversing. And it was kind of stilted until um, I found out that one of, one of the other guys and myself both had daughters and we both hated their boyfriends. <laughs> so, you know, instantly we were just two buds. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing is, is important. We've learned to work together with people around the world of all different cultures, engineers that grew up designing intercontinental ballistic missiles and pointing them at each other. Now we're sitting at the same table designing the space station. And I, I think we underestimate the importance of that. Certainly as a diplomatic tool, it was a big deal. And I think going to Mars is, is a similar thing. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to ask this question. Obviously, uh, we've heard 
other companies, namely SpaceX's plans for, for also going to Mars. Um, competition is a good thing, obviously. They're talking about shorter time frames. What, what would you say are the, are the main differences between your, your plan and, and theirs? So uh, I think, um, I do agree competition is good. I think it um, has stimulated a lot of excitement in our industry, and, right. and that's had uh, really good effects. I always, when I'm asked about the competition, I describe it as a um, golf match. You can only play your own ball. And then at the end, you add up the scores and you, and you see what happened. We don't compete with, directly with each other. We don't try to undermine each other. You know? um, we, we, we maybe um, jab at each other in the press a little bit, um, like you would on a golf course. <laughs> you know? I, don't know. I don't know how many golfers we have in the room. Um, but I think it's, it's that way. I mean, we're, we are, we've laid out a plan that we think is, um, is implementable, doable, and the right approach. And, and I'm working with others in industry who share our view and certainly partnered with NASA, um, you know, we're off on that, on that mission. Wonderful. Well, I absolutely agree with that. You know, if we are as a, uh, as a global community going to be living and working in space and a lot more, it can't just be one company. It takes, it's going to take all of us in the room. Absolutely. And, and around the world. And around the world. Absolutely. Mr. John Elbon, thank you very much for your Thanks. time and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.